cells um, are the, sort of the first major category of these. These are the most abundant of the various blood, white blood cells, at least present when, when you look within the blood. That wouldn't be true if you looked in lymph nodes, for example, or some of the other tissues. But within the blood, neutrophils are the most prolific and abundant. And their main job is to uh, attack and destroy bacteria. And I think as we sort of mentioned at the time, there's two major ways they can do this. One is by phagocytosis, which is where they just sort of reach out little pseudopods because they're basically these little amoeboid cells. Not even really that little. They're fairly large. And they use phagocytosis to reach out with pseudopods, surround the bacterium, bring them into their system, and then they zap them with all kinds of nasty compounds that they have contained within vesicles within them, uh, within these lysosomal vesicles, and they'll destroy those bacteria from, from within. If that doesn't work, or if they get into an area where there's not just sort of a handful of bacteria that are present, and instead uh, they get into an area where there's just massive, massive numbers of bacteria, they will instead employ what's referred to, or deploy, what's referred to as a respiratory burst. And this is where they basically just degranulate. So they release all their lysosomal enzymes outside of the cells, and that will kill the neutrophil, but it's also going to kill everybody else that's nearby, which probably is going to include lots and lots of bacteria. So there's, um, among the things that they will do, these enzymes will do, in addition to just including some proteases, which will just tear up proteins, is they also um, promote lots of oxidative damage in the area. So, you know, usually uh, we try to avoid oxidative damage. Um, so, you know, we will take antioxidants, for example, if you're trying to, you know, stay healthy and um, uh, pro, you know, prolong, uh, ward off the, the, you know, ward off aging and such that occurs with oxidative damage. Um, but what they'll do is, so they will have enzymes that specifically cause oxygen to be turned into superoxide radicals. And superoxide radicals are highly reactive oxygen molecules, basically. They've got an extra electron, which is what the little dot and the negative indicate. So oxygen usually is a neutrally charged molecule. This is O2. But that dot indicates it as an extra electron, and that conveys a negative charge to it. And these things are super reactive. So they, will, um, they can go in and they will donate that extra reactive electron and give it to carbon molecules that exist within organic molecules, and that'll cause the entire organic molecule to get destroyed. It's almost like a little chain reaction where you'll sort of deliver it to a fatty acid, and then the fatty acid will just sort of implode on itself as a result of getting this extra electrode, electron. So this is why usually we're trying to avoid oxidative damage, but the idea here is these superoxide radicals are going to be deployed around all these bacteria, and they will ultimately kill those bacteria. In addition, the superoxide to directly attacking organic molecules, superoxide also can react uh, with water molecules to form hydrogen peroxide, which some people will use just as sort of a topical, um, uh, topical cleaner, topical antibiotic sort of agent. Um, I, you know, for a while, I was, uh, we were suspecting I was allergic to, um, you know, just, well, it was Panalog, but it was one of these sort of typical antibiotic ointments. So I was just, you know, I would often just use hydrogen peroxide as a way if I had some kind of a paper cut or something uh, to, to treat that paper cut and help to uh, knock down the infection. They also um, uh, have enzymes that will create hypochlorite, which is just bleach and release bleach off into the solution. So it's this, it's called a respiratory burst because it does involve lots of these respiratory or oxidative compounds that'll cause respiratory damage in that particular area, respiratory from sort of a chemical sense of respiratory. And um, as a result, you'll kill all the bacteria nearby. And so you'll have these sort of large zones that are just devoid of life uh, within your system, but hopefully that'll wipe out a bacterial infection before it has a, the ability to cause additional problems. So I think they're pretty cool. I, I, I refer to this as, as the nuclear option. You know, this is just, uh, just going for broke. Kaboom. In addition to neutrophils, we also have macrophages. And macrophages definitely can gobble up bacteria, too. Um, and they can gobble up other sorts of debris. Uh, you have a wide variety of different kinds of macrophages present within your system. Some are uh, free to just sort of wander around your tissues, and many of them do that. Others are more fixed. So, for example, um, microglia up in the, the nervous system are a, really, they're kind of macrophage. They don't wander, they just sort of sit there, but their job is to gobble up anything that gets near them and help to, um, help to clean and clear your nervous system, your central nervous system. Uh, other types of fixed macrophages also include those that are found in the liver and also in the lungs. 
There's something really similar to these in the integumentary system that are called dendritic cells. Dendritic cells aren't technically macrophages, but they're very, very similar in, in function. <coughs> um, the only real difference is that they use uh, receptor-mediated endocytosis to consume things, whereas macrophages just use straight-up phagocytosis. That's kind of a subtle difference. Um, both macrophages and dendritic cells, though, also play an important role. It doesn't say it here, but we'll get to it later, where as they gobble stuff up, so as they consume bacteria, for example, from their surroundings, they will break up those bacteria and grab particles from the bacteria, like small pieces of proteins that were in on those bacteria, and they will present them on their cell surfaces. They're sort of advertising, hey, here's what I just ate recently. And then other immune cells that you have can observe those, uh, those compounds that they're presenting on their cell surfaces, and um, that can sometimes prompt an immune response. Uh, so that, you know, macrophages, as we'll see when we get to the adaptive immune system, actually play a really important role, as do these dendritic cells. We call them, I'll just put the term up now so you can connect it later. Um, these, so we call these things antigen-presenting cells, or APCs. Okay. All right. So that's one big category of some of these adaptive cell, or I'm sorry, these non-adaptive, non-specific defenses uh, include these phagocytes. There's another cell type that also fits in this category of non-specific defenses that are pretty cool. It's a type of lymphocyte. We'll spend a lot of time talking about lymphocytes when we get to specific defenses, um, but these ones are called natural killer cells. Natural killer cells are really cool. A, they have a wicked good name. I mean, that's just, that's such a good, I just love that name, uh, for an immune cell. I think it would be an awesome band name. Um, they, uh, so when you look at the different kinds of lymphocytes, so of the leukocytes, you have lymphocytes. Um, most of the lymphocytes we run into are going to be T cells. The next largest category are the B cells. And again, these are both involved in our specific defenses or our adaptive immune system, our memory-based immune system. But this last component is a relatively small percentage of them. It's only 5%. They're called natural killer cells, but they do have an important role to play in providing what's called immune surveillance. So the idea here is that every cell in your body will present surface tags that identify that cell as being part of you. Um, so these are actually called major histocompatibility complex proteins, and we will talk about them later. So I've just put MHCs, uh, C later. Um, we produce these all the time, and we are displaying them on all of the cells that exist around our entire body. Natural killer cells' job is to just basically roam around the body and check every cell they encounter and verify that each of those cells is presenting the appropriate self-recognition tag. If they find a cell that doesn't have that appropriate self-recognition tag, this could be a bacterium, this could be, you know, a foreign eukaryotic cell, but it, so it's a cell, but it doesn't have the right self-recognition tags, the uh, natural killer cell will then dock, attach to that cell, and kill it. The way it does that uh, is basically two steps. Um, so here's a natural killer cell that has found an enemy cell that didn't have the right tags, the right little glycoprotein sticking on its cell surface that identify it as being part of you. So the natural killer cell docks on that cell, and then first it will release a series of proteins that are called perforins. Perforins are released in little subunits, but they will immediately kind of form up and plug into the membrane of the, the enemy cell and create a, just a big hole. So you're basically like punching a hole, and that in itself is catastrophic because now this enemy cell no longer has the ability to regulate what's on the inside versus the outside of the cell. So it's going to lose lots of nutrients. Uh, you'll have a, um, ions moving this way and that, so it won't be able to maintain an appropriate membrane potential. Um, this, you know, just alone, having those perforins present is catastrophic. But on top of that, the natural killer cell will then also release what are called granzymes. The granzymes will be able to invade the enemy cell through that hole they just punched in with the perforins, They'll move in, and they'll just start cutting up all the enemy cell's uh, enzymes. They'll chop up its DNA, and ultimately the cell will just implode. The enemy cell will. So here's a cell that's imploding uh, uh, by what's this, it's a process that's called apoptosis. The first time apoptosis was ever described, it was more of a programmed cell death. So it was like normal course of development. This is how we like lose the skin that's between our toes early on in development. Um, 
But uh, here, it's the same sort of process, but this isn't really a programmed cell death. But, you know, the, the DNA has been fragmented. The cells kind of start to bleb off, which you can kind of see here. They're sort of blebbing away. And ultimately, then, this cell, uh, the, the natural killer cell, will leave and go on its way. This cell will eventually die and will be captured by a macrophage. So you have to, this picture is a little bit weird, so you have to sort of zoom out on that. That cell is the same as that one that's now getting gobbled up by one of these giant macrophages. It does give you a sense of scale for natural killer cells, too, because a natural killer cell would be like this big, right? There they are. <coughs> I think they're pretty neat cells. Uh, and they do play this important function of attacking, you know, any foreign cell. It's generalized, though. Sorry, but everybody, it's generalized, non-specific defense, though. So it's not targeting one specific bacterium or one specific pathogen. What you're doing here is you are attacking anything that's not you. So we call it a non-specific defense. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. That's a really interesting question. So um, most of the time, I think the default expectation is cancer cells would still produce the MHCs. And so in that way, these would not be effective anti-cancer drugs. But what sometimes will happen with a cancer, because we have other systems that use MHCs to identify the cancer. Um, so what sometimes will happen with uh, cancer cells, and frankly also virus-infected cells will do this, is they'll prompt the, the host cell effectively to start not producing MHCs anymore to hide from this other part of the immune system, at which point these guys can sort of step in and, you know, attack them. So they're, they're probably usually not the best anti-cancer defense, but I guess they can be involved. All right. So that's, those are our two major cell types. I guess we talked about three types of cells. We talked about macrophages, um, we talked about neutrophils, and we're talking about natural killer cells. But sort of the phagocytes versus natural killer cells are the two major cell types uh, that we're dealing with when we're talking about nonspecific defenses. Um, there's also, we're going to talk a lot about specific defense proteins, but there are some proteins that have nonspecific defense capability. Um, so I want to talk about generalized antimicrobial proteins here. And there's basically two categories of these. The first one are what are called interferons. Um, interferons are, are interesting. These are basically um, proteins that are designed to help us combat viral infections. And they do this in a couple of different ways. The first thing is, so, so in this process, we'll, we'll walk through the figure. Here's a little virus. Viruses are these non-living entities, but they contain some kind of nucleic acid usually. Uh, either RNA or DNA that they will inject into a host cell, and then the, they kind of take over the host cell's machinery such that um, the host cell then starts to manufacture new viral proteins and replicate the viral nucleic acid and create new viruses. So here you've got a virus that infects a host cell within your body. It's injected its, uh, its little nucleic acid, which is then causing you to start making new viruses. And that's happened, and you're sort of like, you're stuck with it. That cell is in trouble. This cell, though, is not wholly defenseless, um, and what it will do once it's infected is that it will start to release what are called interferons, which are these little cell proteins, these communication proteins. And interferons do two major things. Uh, the first thing is they'll diffuse into the nearby area, and they'll bump into lots of the surrounding cells within that same tissue. So you could sort of imagine if this is within a connective tissue, you might have a bunch of fibroblasts, for example, in that area. One of them gets infected by a virus, it'll start releasing interferons that'll go and interact with all the other fibroblasts that are nearby. Those fibroblasts have receptors for interferons. So when the other fibroblasts, the ones that haven't been infected yet, receive this signal from the first cell, which did get infected, uh, it says, oh, uh-oh, there are viruses in the area, and they will turn on antiviral defenses. Usually, antiviral defenses include um, just, A, like reducing gene expression overall, so the cell kind of has to temporarily reduce how many proteins it's going to manufacture. They also may manufacture certain specific proteins, enzymes that are designed to seek out and destroy viruses that they may not manufacture all the time, but they can upregulate the manufacture of those particular compounds and enzymes. 
And so in so doing, they may be able to block this next, the virus from once the virus is produced over here and, and diffuses over, tries to infect this cell, they uh, hopefully will be able to block this virus from being able to actually infect them, um, you know, by temporarily turning on these antiviral measures, which might not be the, you know, the, the antiviral uh, measures might not be something they can do all the time because it might, you know, put them at a disadvantage in terms of their own gene expression, but hopefully they can block the virus from infecting to start, and in so doing, um, you know, prevent the problem, and then, you know, once that sort of crisis lapses, then they can go back to sort of normal operations and normal gene expression. In addition to that, these, um, these interferons will also attract macrophages and natural killer cells into the area, which then can swoop in and start attacking uh, the, the foreign agents. So I describe them as sort of like kill me, save yourselves type of uh, proteins. Their job is to warn other, or warn cells that are nearby, hey, I've been infected, either come kill me, or, you know, prevent yourself from getting infected by upregulating your antiviral defenses. All right. That's one. The other type of non-specific antimicrobial protein we're going to talk about is the complement system, which is a uh, not just one protein, it's a large network of system or a large suite of proteins. They're all named by number. And so um, describing this is off, it's one of these, this is one of these fields where if you start to get real specific about it, uh, the descriptions and names for these things start to make a lot more sense and a lot, lot easier when you read them than when you try to say them aloud. Because you'll have like a bunch of these little complement proteins, each of which has a number, getting together to form a complex. So each one, there might be C21 and C24, and they might make this complex that might be C21, C24, C25, C27, and like the name of the thing is just, you have to read that out loud. Um, but in any case, getting ahead of myself, these are a really interesting set of proteins because again, they're not designed to kill any one thing. They're designed to be generalized antimicrobial and really antibacterial cells. It's they're a suite of 30 or more, more than 30 globulins, so that's that term globulins we talked about in the blood chapter, that are involved in specific and nonspecific immunity, but for the most part we're going to talk about their role in nonspecific immunity uh, in this chapter, <coughs> or this part of the chapter. They combat pathogens by four main processes. Um, they promote inflammation, so they get an inflammatory process started, and we'll talk about infl uh, inflammation on the homework that will, uh, is due tomorrow. Uh, they promote immune clearance, which we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, but this is where you're getting rid of antibody antigen complexes. They promote opsonization, and they promote cytolysis. Um, and so we have to go through what each of these things are in turn, and we need to talk about exactly how it is that they work. Um, so basically, we're going to start with trying to talk about how we start this pathway. There's three main initiation pathways that get the complement system going. Uh, there's, and they are in turn, there's the classical pathway, the alternative pathway, and the lectin pathway. And so your book has, like if you look online, uh, I found the descriptions in your book to be a little bit confusing. They're, they're okay, uh, but they don't have any good graphics, I felt. And they do have some animations on Connect, but I just, again, I think they run into this problem where they try to get way too specific and they're kind of horrible to deal with. Um, so I, um, what I did is I tried to create some little uh, PowerPoint movies. Um, so, okay, let me set this up. So we have three different initiation pathways. There's the classical pathway, alternative pathway, and lectin pathway. And I made a little movie for each of these three. So what we'll do is we're going to try to work through each of the initiation pathways. I'm going to point out all three of those pathways do a thing. It's kind of like the blood clotting pathway. They all converge at one spot. And that is they're, they're going to break a complement protein called C3 into two parts, C3A and C3B. And then C3A and B have specific jobs related to these four mechanisms of combating pathogens, the, the inflammation, immune clearance, phagocytosis, anopsinization, and cytolysis. So we're going to walk through first the initiation, and then we'll talk about more about like how they actually attack pathogens in a sec. So the first of the initiation pathways is called the classical pathway. So the classical pathway is going to involve an antibody. So we're kind of mingling nonspecific and specific defenses here. Well, you'll have to bear with me. So here what's happened, that's an antibody, not drawn to scale. 
Uh, and it has just come up here and is bound to this bacterium. So there's little antigens that are present on the bacterial cell surface that these variable regions out here on the antibody have just bound to. Once that happens, let me back up, once that happens, you'll note that this particular antibody that, our, uh, that some of our B cells have produced has this site that's called a complement binding site. And this site is the part of the antibody that actually helps to initiate this complement protein sequence. So what will happen is that you'll have a different complement protein than the C3 we, men we mentioned. It's called C1. Uh, these were numbered in order the, of discovery. So this is the very first of the complement proteins that was discovered. And they found, they called it a complement protein, because when C1 bound to an antibody, shortly thereafter, they found that, the, that there was an increased, uh, more vigorous response against this bacterium. Uh, specifically what happens is once C1 binds to the complement binding site here, that causes a chain reaction to occur where several proteins will be activated along the way, and eventually what will happen is the C3 molecule, which I'm drawing kind of like as a long pill, gets broken into two, its two parts, C3A and C3B. And then C3A and C3B then can do different things. C3A diffuses away, and it's going to prompt an, uh, prompt an inflammatory response. C3B ends up binding to the bacterium itself and can promote some of these other mechanisms, which includes, it, it just by binding, it can um, play an important role in, in, um, in phagocytosis, which we'll get to in just a little bit. So each of these two components has some sort of important role in the response. Um, this guy is sticking to the invader. This guy is prompting an inflammatory response. They both came from this original protein, if I step back a bit, this original protein C3, which was broken in half in response to the fact that complement one bound to the complement binding site on the antibody. All right, so that's the classical pathway by which we could initiate this complement system. There's two other pathways though. So it's called the classical pathway because this was the first one that was discovered. And once they discovered other ones, this one became classic, right? It's sort of like the original pathway. Here's the second one that was discovered. They called it the alternative pathway because it was the alternative to the classical pathway. It all makes sense. And this pathway, what they found is that while C3 can be broken apart when C1 hits its binding site on an antibody, C3 also can just spontaneously break apart now and then. It's not tightly bound together. And so within the blood, it will spontaneously break apart every now and then. And usually what will happen is that if there is no foreign bacterium around, then C3A will eventually reattach to C3B and you'll be back to having a nice C3 protein, which is non-reactive. However, if a bacterium is present, then C3B will stick to that bacterium. C3B is really good at sticking to bacteria. And once it's attached, it actually promotes a positive feedback loop where just having C3B attached here causes more C3 to break apart, which then the C3B will bind to that bacterium, and that'll happen over and over and over again. And so while you might just have this sort of like rare event where just occasionally a C3 will break apart on its own spontaneously, once you get your first C3B bound to bacterium, that'll prompt more and more and more of this to happen. So you get a nice little positive feedback loop, and this bacterium will just get coated in C3B. At the same time, C3A whoops, will diffuse away and prompt infl an inflammatory response. So they're going to now do their same jobs. It's just we've done this without any antibody present at all. And it doesn't kind of really matter that much what kind of bacterium. I'm sure there are some bacteria that are more susceptible to these things than others. But any, you know, these are theoretically capable of attacking at least many different kinds of bacteria. And they're doing so just by sort of glomming all over it. And we'll talk about what that does in a bit. So we have the classical pathway, the alternative pathway, and I think that works reasonably well as names when there's just two things. There's the original and classical, and then there's the alternative, but then they discovered another one. It's called the lectin pathway. So this is kind of the alternative to the alternative, but the lectin pathway uh, is responsible for uh, what happens in this pathway. Is there's this other, pro this other compound, 
think it's kind of a, I think it's a glycoprotein if I remember right. It's called lectin. Lectin is very good at binding to sugars that exist on most, most microbial cell surfaces. And so we make lectin, and when it's, it's released into the blood, and then it can bind to a bacterium. Once it does so, uh, that lectin being bound to a bacterium can prompt the breakage of C3 into C3A and C3B. And of course, we know that once you have that happen, C3A will diffuse away and prompt inflammation, and C3B will come over here and stick to the bacterium. So we have our three different mechanisms, right? If I can go back, do I have that? Well, I'm going to go back all the way to this sort of master image. Uh, come on. So we had our classical pathway. We had our antibody, uh, antibody independent or alternative pathway. And we have the lectin pathway. All three resulted in C3 breaking apart into C3A and C3B. So now we need to try to understand what is each of those different components going to do. i got to flip for all this again. So what happens after complement activation? As we mentioned, C3A will diffuse away. It's going to initiate an inflammatory response. So it will interact with mast cells if you're in the integument, or basophils if you're in the blood, or similar kinds of tissues, <coughs> to secrete histamine. Histamine is an inflammatory compound, and that'll trigger an inflammatory response. So you'll get swelling, you'll get activation, or you know, you get more permeable blood vessels, you'll have uh, attraction for other kinds of white blood cells to get into the area, neutrophils and such, to attack that bacterium that was there. Uh, we're going to activate macrophages and neutrophils. As I mentioned, we're going to increase blood vessel permeability and vasodilate blood vessels, so we'll swell. Uh, all these things are going to deliver an immune response into this area where C3A came from. So we're going to sort of activate our immune system. This is the, the communicator that goes away from the site of the infection, but it's telling other parts of our immune system, hey, we've got an infection, time to come in here and deal with that. C3B will coat the bacteria. Um, by coating the bacteria, it's called opsonization. Opsonization, literally, if you go back to the Latin, literally means making something more tasty. Um, and so what it will do is it's kind of providing little handholds all over the bacterium that makes it easier for macrophages or neutrophils to come in and consume the bacterium by phagocytosis. So it's, uh, it's, it's literally just making it easier for phagocytosis to cap to happen, so we call it opsonization, or making, making a bacteria more tasty to eat. Uh, in addition to that, C through B can do a couple of other things. So um, when you have, again, we're sort of intermingling with the antibody-based uh, systems here too, when you have antigen-antibody complexes um, present, What's happened there is you're, you've got uh, memory-based immunity uh, B cells transformed into something called plasma cells that manufacture antibodies. The antibodies are then sticking to foreign pathogens. What they can do uh, is that uh, they can interact with this antigen-antibody complex, and then they can basically serve as like a glue to bind that antigen-antibody complex to a red blood cell. The red blood cells then basically are going to carry the antigen-antibody complex into the liver or into the spleen, where macrophages basically can pluck it off of the red blood cells, leaving the red blood cells intact, and then consume the antigen-antibody complex and dispose of it. So we call that immune clearance. This is kind of like, what do you do? This is how we get rid of these antigen-antibody complexes after the antibodies have kind of done their job. They've bound to their target thing. They've neutralized it. Now we need to get rid of the whole complex. And that's done in part through this C3B stuff, because the C3B can serve as a glue to, to bind uh, these antigen antibody complexes onto red blood cells. C3B does one other really cool thing, and it involves many other complement proteins. And that is that C3B prompts a different kind of complement protein called C5 to break apart into two parts. Uh, and it will break into C5A and C5B. C5A serves as a chemoattractant for macrophages, so it's a pretty similar role to C3A. It's not really inflammation, but it's at least attracting macrophages in the area. It's a communicator. C5B, though, along with C3B, will create what's called a membrane attack complex by interacting with some additional complement proteins. And this is going to ultimately result in the destruction of the target cell. 
So here's another picture. So there's C3 breaking into C3A and C3B. C3A is causing inflammation. C3B can cause opsonization to help with phagocytosis. Or C3B can interact with C5B, which releases C5A also, but also then with C6, C7, C8, C9. So this thing is literally called, once it's all complexed together, it's called C3B, C5B, C6, C7, C8, C9. That's what it's called. So it doesn't work very well in sort of oral presentations. But this, comp this structure serves as kind of like one spoke that then will embed itself in the bacterial cell membrane. And then you'll get additional spokes that do this, and it'll create a pore. Kind of like the perforins did. It's a different molecule, but um, it's creating a big hole in the membrane of the bacterium. And because now there's this giant hole in the membrane of the bacterium, the, the bacteria can no longer regulate what's going in and out of its cell. So it's going to lose all of its nutrients. They're just going to diffuse out, which is what this is showing. Uh, sometimes you'll have the, its DNA even leaving, uh, just being swept away. Uh, you'll have the inability to maintain any kind of a membrane potential, which is highly disruptive to these cells. And so uh, in this way, the membrane attack complex, sometimes they call it the MAC attack, which is great, right? So membrane attack complex is, is MAC. So a MAC attack is that you create this giant pore in the membrane of the cell. It's good stuff. So that's the complement system in a nutshell. There are, I, would, I mean, at least there are 20 more different complement proteins that we're not talking about today. But this gives you sort of a basic foundation in complement system. Uh, if you take immunology, you get a little bit more. Um, There's a 300 level class our biology department offers. Questions on complement proteins? Right. Well then, what's left then is to talk about specific immunity. And this is probably still half the chapter to go, because um, this is a big topic. And we've been kind of hinting at this, but uh, in specific immunity, what we're trying to do is we're trying to create defenses against specific foes. And the key thing that distinguishes this from the other systems Whoa, whoops. The key thing that distinguishes this from the other systems is that it includes memory, uh, which means that we are, um, we are retaining knowledge effectively. It's almost like remembering something. It's not using neurons, though. Uh, we are uh, somehow re restoring some sort of signature about this pathogen such that we're going to combat it now. But then the next time we see the thing, we will already have good effective defenses against it, and we'll be much better at, at handling that pathogen the next time we encounter it. So as this is probably hinting this way, but you can probably already see this is sort of the basis of vaccination too, right? So, and, and certainly the basis of why many times if you get one, if you get an infectious disease one time, you're basically immune after that. Uh, and that's because you've created these memory cells after the first bout with it that are capable of effectively combating the thing if they ever encounter it again. There are two kinds of specific immunity. Um, so there's cellular-based immunity or cell-mediated immunity, which is where our, we have T cells that will, are designed to seek out and destroy and kill other cells. And so this is very good at killing either infected host cells, so cells that are harboring viruses and they're infected by viruses, or cells that have become cancerous. So this is really... Cellular-based immunity is probably our best anti-cancer uh, defense once a cell has actually become cancerous. So we have all kinds of little uh, molecular level defenses within cells to keep them from getting cancerous in the first place. But once you've lost a cell, it's gone, it's gone rogue. Uh, Cellular-based immunity is our best defense against it. Then we also have humoral immunity. Humoral refers to blood, right? So, you know, a humoral stimulus in the hormone chapter was a uh, stimulus where you're directly monitoring something about the blood. Humoral immunity is where we're creating blood proteins, antibodies, uh, in order to attack, attack foreign invaders. And really, um, here, rather than attacking a particular, usually rather than attacking foreign cells, although we will make antibodies that will attack foreign bacterial cells, 
um, we're targeting extracellular proteins. So we could be targeting the extracellular proteins on the bacterium, but you can also be attacking the virus cell coat as this virus is circulating around within your system. So we're doing that by having anti creating antibodies that will bind to that very specific pathogen. And in both of these cases, we will, the first time we encounter a pathogen, we certainly will upregulate and mobilize defenses using these systems at that time to attack the pathogen, but we're also going to create memory cells that will allow us to much more effectively deal with it the next time we encounter it. In both cases, both cellular immunity as well as humoral immunity, our systems, that these systems attacks are going to be focused on very specific antigens. So we need to talk about what antigens are. Um, so I've been banting that term around uh, all chapter. <coughs> so antigen literally just means a molecule that can trigger some kind of immune response. And it could be virtually any kind of a molecule, but usually you're dealing with a protein or a sugar molecule, or usually it's some kind of like a glycosugar or a glycoprotein molecule. Um, glycosugar, I don't know what that is. Um, but a glycoprotein molecule. Uh, so antigen, the term actually comes from antibody generating molecules. So these are molecules that are used uh, as the targets for antibodies. Usually we're dealing with big complex protein molecules. So here's a protein antigen that they're showing. This is not the most elegant of uh, descriptions, but I think it does a nice job of showing what we're trying to uh, illustrate here. So, you know, proteins get folded into beta sheets or alpha helices. Here's some other beta sheets. And they generally are folded around each other, and you have little domains around that antigen, each of which do different things. Generally speaking, we wouldn't generate an, uh, an antibody, if we're creating antibodies, that would attack the entire protein antigen like this. Instead, what we would do is create an antibody that would target one little spot on this overall antigen. So if we describe the entire protein as the antigen, the specific spot that an antibody would bind to is referred to as an epitope, or some people call it an antigen determinant. That's the other term. I like epitope. Um, here, in this case, they're showing this protein antigen has four different epitopes, and there could potentially be more of them. But the idea is that a different antibody would probably bind each of these different kinds of epitopes. So epitope 1 would bind antibody 1. So antibody 1 would be very specific for this epitope. But antibody 1 would not be able to bind to um, epitope 3 over here, even though it's all part of the same protein molecule, because there's a different sequence and there's a different shape. Uh, there's a different sequence of amino acids, so there's different polarities and charges and different shape in this area than there is over here in this area. So antibodies will be very, very specific to a particular epitopes within an antigen. Did I see you raise your hand or is that? No. Yeah, so, so like you might describe it, the, the whole protein might be the antigen. But really, like what's, what's important are these epitopes, which are just the particular sites on a large antigen where an antibody would, would bind. So it's just this little spot. That's where the antibody's going to target. It's the epitope that's really important. Now, aside from this slide, for the most part, I'm just going to refer to, we'll just be talking about antigens. But usually, really, what we're talking about is probably just like one epitope on an antigen. That's what we're going to be focusing on. That's where the antibody's actually binding. Um, as a little aside, there's an interesting thing that can happen sometimes where um, small molecules can enter into our system and bind other molecules to form an antigen or an epitope. Um, so uh, poison ivy is notorious for this. So the little particles that are in poison ivy that, are, that cause the, um, the inflammatory response that causes the rash when you get poison ivy are not particularly large molecules. And in fact, by themselves, those little molecules that are created by poison ivy uh, can't actually cause any kind of an inflammatory response on their own. They can't really do anything to you on their own. But what happens is those small little particles that the poison ivy releases binds to other molecules that are already present on your skin surface or in, uh, I don't know where it is on the skin surface or if it's just below the skin surface uh, where they're binding. They bind to those other molecules though and they create then, you know, you know, one molecule here bound to this little molecule here. The little molecule released by the poison ivy is called a haptin, uh, but then you might get an antibody response that would bind to this whole structure, and it would be binding to both 
the haptin as well as the original molecule in your system. And so this whole thing then becomes uh, your, your antigen. Hopefully that makes sense. It's kind of an aside. I'm not really going to do any more with that. But again, the reason that at least people that are allergic to uh, poison ivy, like I so far <coughs> have not developed that allergy. So I can, you know, I have brushed with poison ivy before and it hasn't done anything to me. I haven't gotten any kind of a rash to it. I've known people that have developed a rash, though, so I'm certainly very careful with it because I know it is, uh, it's, it's very easy to develop that rash, and once you do it, it can sometimes be incredibly potent. Okay. So let's see. I said I was going to pause again. So let's pause here. This is a good spot before we launch into this and start telling the story here. Um, so I got 9.27, so let's resume at 9.32. And we will finish uh, finish this story.